uh, brought over to biology to look at issue, particularly now uh, our main focus is to look at this in the context of cancer, uh, to differentiate normal cells from uh, uh, transformed cells in the context of aging, understand changes in mitochondrial structure uh, as uh, we go through the aging process. Uh, uh, my website is shown on the left hand side, uh, email address on the right at the bottom. And again, I'd like to thank you very much for your attention and I'm happy to answer your question. Uh, Dr. Subramaniam, I have a few queries. Uh, you showed uh, resolutions from 3.8 to 1.8, which is amazing. Uh, my queries are first, what was the number of particles you picked up for the class averages in each case with increasing resolution? The second was, what was the sigma contours of your electron density maps? And as far as the ligand is concerned, what was the occupancy of the ligand and uh, you contoured the ligand density at what sigma? Did you, did you get that? Let me say it back. Right. Uh, so the first question was, was uh, how many particles that went into different class averages? Is that right? Uh, the, they, they vary. I think uh, what we find is quality matters more than quantity. Uh, and uh, these, when we, went, when we reported getting electricity, like they said uh, close to the we had about 40,000 particles in the mix. Uh, we work with uh, the major receptor, similar to 60,000 or thereabouts. So the number itself uh, doesn't seem to be such a critical factor, but the quality of the image and the information in the Fourier domain, uh, that's uh, probably the most important. I mean. Your second question was uh, something to do with the uh, density map. I Ah, uh, yeah, okay. Yeah, let me address that. So you're asking me what's the sigma value? So you, your question is, what is the sigma value at which uh, we are showing these maps? Is that right? So let me clarify. So the, the maps that we get from CryoVM are uh, what we call uh, electron potential maps. They're not really electron density maps and not subject to the same sigma scaling that you might look at a 2 f and uh, FC. What actually uh, what we are showing are thresholds that you can loosely convert into uh, you know, something that is similar to what is seen in electron density map, uh, but a direct correspondence to uh, sigma value is actually not, uh, not so meaningful. Uh, and the other fa uh, the other uh, fact that's quite different is these are maps that come from the data, the experimental map. No model used in producing them. So, unlike a 2FO minus FC map where you have phases that come from a model, here the, the phases come from the data. And because it's a uh, protein in solution, you have variable order. And so, it's, it's closer to an NMR situation where you have proteins that are essentially dynamic. And, uh, the B factors, if you think of B factors the way you do in crystallography, the B factors vary a lot. Uh, from the inside to the outside, that doesn't mean the structure is poorly resolved. So, we, these density maps that I'm showing have B factors, and you can actually download these from the data bank and you can apply your own B factors to look at these structures. But maybe this is a better question offline if you can email. Thank you. Uh, Voltage-gated ion cell in the neuron cell, uh, ion channels in the neuron cell. So uh, the transport of ions uh, through the channel is under the influence of electromagnetic field, which is uh, coming from the electrical activity uh, uh, from the neuron itself. So, uh, so how s uh, 
so such environment affects the uh, the predictions okay. uh so your question is uh, your question is whether the structures we observe are influenced or do be influenced by electrochemical potential or transmembrane potential uh, so these are studies the membrane protein studies i showed are with membrane proteins solubilized in lipid detergent micelles mm. and in some cases with amphibol uh, but they do not have a close membrane so we have no gradients uh, uh, the work with hiv which i did speak about those were all done with intact viruses uh, so there uh, that work i i see will be extended looking at uh, structures of proteins in vesicles and there perhaps we can do the kind of experiment that you were uh, just suggest Yes, bye. So, bye. It's a great pleasure to to introduce next as the next speaker another contemporary of mine uh, who is uh, Mark Brayman. Uh, Mark uh, was born and raised in Rochester, New York. He received his BA uh, in 1977 from Harvard. Uh, his PhD in biophysical chemistry from the University of Berkeley and then joined Gobin's lab as a Ken with uh, Gobin's lab actually in collaboration with Kenneth Rothschild of Boston University uh, between 83 and 88 supported by uh, Helen Wehey Whitney Foundation Fellowship and the Lucille Markey Scholar Award uh, from 88 to 98 he was assistant and then associate professor at the University of Virginia Medical School and uh, received the Whitaker Foundation Young Investigator Award. And since 1998, Mark has been professor of chemistry at Syracuse University. Mark. Oh. Uh, no. Okay, thank you, Sabina, for the introduction. Thanks to the organizers, uh, Rajinder and uh, Tom, for inviting me to come and speak. And also thank you to the local people, Dr. Jay and his team of, of wonderful uh, students who have uh, made the logistics so much uh, more comfortable for a first time visitor to India than they could have been. Uh, it's, it's been very uh, helpful uh, to have their assistance at every step of the way. Let me start with one of my fondest uh, memories of Gobind, uh, he, you saw the video, he mentioned his cottage in New Hampshire and some of the trips that he invited uh, the, the lab to go on up there uh, were wonderful. I remember one time being one of the first to arrive and standing with Gobind on the, the deck looking out as uh, down the hill as some more people were arriving and uh, out of her car came Dr. Breitenberger, Caroline Breitenberger, and uh, one of the things she did after unloading her uh, plastic cooler chest was putting it on her head and walking up the hill towards the house and uh, Gobin looked down at that and said, oh Caroline's carrying that the way I used to carry water on my head in my village. And that really cemented, crystallized for me, the idea uh, of uh, Gobin as a, an exemplar of not only geographic mobility, but also uh, economic and uh, social mobility uh, and technological mobility in the 20th century. And I try to uh, pay homage to that uh, in uh, my interactions with students who come from backgrounds that are not as privileged as mine. Uh, and that's one of the reasons that I, I came here was to help make sure that I get a chance to pay some homage to that. Well, uh, one of the recurrent themes in the structure and function of the membrane proteins that Gobind focused on uh, is the behavior of our conserved arginine residues that during uh, the activation of these proteins undergo quite large conformational swings including into regions of the membrane where they're pretty well excluded from uh, most of the water uh, that they would normally be uh, found surrounded by. Uh, this is true not only for those membrane proteins, but also for some other membrane proteins that have been uh, looked at lately. So, for example, voltage-gated uh, ion channels. And uh, 
even this uh, example of the, one of the smallest uh, proteins, actually just a dipeptide that involves arginine, is the uh, endogenous brain analgesic, uh, Kyotorfin. Where do I, oops, I'm going here. Uh, this is just uh, tyrosine arginine, uh, and it was first isolated in 1979 from rat brains. Uh, the demonstration that it functions as an analgesic originally required that it be injected into rat brains directly uh, because it couldn't get past the blood-brain barrier. Uh, more recently, people have modified the uh, C terminus of this with uh, more lipophilic groups and have just recently shown that they can get it through the blood brain barrier after in intravenous injection. Uh, one of the reasons that, that this uh, dipeptide is interesting as a painkiller, an analgesic, is because it, uh, its mechanism of action doesn't seem to uh, involve direct binding to a G protein coupled receptor. And yet, uh, it it definitely requires a membrane and signals across the membrane, and uh, there is uh, very good evidence that it activates uh, inhibitory G protein, GI, the same one that is activated by the opioid receptors. Uh, of course, um, many people are familiar with the opioid dr uh, dr drug epidemic in the US, and there's a, a great need to develop drugs that don't exhibit the same problems with addiction. Uh, one of the issues with the opioids is that uh, the opioid receptors have a number of desensitization mechanisms built in, and that desens desensitization is part of the mechanism of tolerance, which is part of the problem with uh, current analgesics. So the, there is a computed folded structure for keotorphin inside a membrane. Actually, in aqueous solution, it's expected to have a, a fairly uh, uh, extended structure. This structure shows a direct inter interaction between the tyrosine and the uh, guanidine group of the arginine side chain. Uh, this, of course, is a computed structure. No one has done a crystal structure of this inside a membrane protein. And this sort of highlights the need uh, for developing small molecule models uh, that can really inform both the computations and uh, serve as models for spectroscopy for uh, techniques biophysical techniques other than actual uh, crystal uh, structure solution to tell what the structure of the arginine is. One of the major questions is what the protonation states are uh, in this system. Here it's shown that both the guanidine uh, being fully protonated and the tyrosine being fully protonated. But uh, it's very difficult with any uh, existing uh, techniques to be absolutely definitive about that. And I, one of the things that I will show you is that some of the uh, assumptions or conclusions that people have made in the past may be based on shaky experimental evidence. Okay, one of the, uh, oh, before I do this, I want to mention that uh, already in the 1990s we were uh, starting to try to model uh, guanidine side chains in, lip, in uh, non-polar environments. Uh, we started with purchasing the ethyl guanidine molecule, which is just the, the, the tail end of the side chain of, of arginine. Uh, ethyl guanidine carbonate and several other salts uh, were commercially available for about a, a dollar a, a, a milligram. And so we were able to do some experiments where we, where we replaced the carbonate with other counter ions and we were able to measure uh, uh, various kinds of, of uh, spectroscopic properties of these uh, ethyl guanidine salts. But it became clear uh, from e the low solubility even of the ethyl guanidine salts in nonpolar media, the limit uh, in chloroform was less than one millimolar, uh, that we needed to find a way to get uh, more, uh, more of these uh, uh, compounds into very nonpolar solutions that could uh, mimic the interior of membranes. Uh, the, the uh, solution that we uh, um, that became clear was we needed a longer side chain or or something that was a, a, a bigger uh, uh, hydrocarbon group, and uh, I was thinking uh, after doing an extensive search of what was commercially available that I was going to have to uh, embark on a synthesis program, but uh, around the time I moved to Syracuse, uh, several convergent factors uh, made this uh, unnecessary for, to start. Uh, one was 
better searches on the internet, okay, which allowed me to realize that even though uh, long chain uh, alkyl guanidines were not available from traditional research chemistry suppliers, that uh, they have a commercial use. And uh, dodecyl guanidine, as it turns out, is made in quantities of uh, millions of tons internationally. Uh, and I thought I would show this since this is an Agri-Food Biotechnology Institute. Uh, uh, the uh, area around Syracuse is used, uh, it has a, a big agricultural industry based on growing fruit, uh, mainly apples and grapes. And uh, so the uh, use of dodecyl guanidine as a fruit fungicide made it possible for me to purchase several uh, kilograms. This is a two kilogram bag of this fruit fungicide uh, that is 60% dodecyl guanidine and the rest is, is sort of an inert clay. And I was able to purchase this out of my own pocket uh, at a local store uh, for about $30. Uh, this uh, gave enough quantities that I could just turn it over to both undergraduates and graduates in the lab and tell them to play with it and see if they could figure out uh, how they could deprotonate it. Uh, it turns out that uh, de definitive deprotonation of uh, guanidines in nonpolar solvents is, is a problem that it really turns out was never solved, okay? Uh, well, uh, Andrew Banyikwa, uh, a, a, a very persistent graduate student, finally figured out how to deprotonate dodecyl guanidine in 2012. He relied on uh, standing on the shoulders of a group that had uh, just recently, in 2007, published a crystal structure of just guanidine. CN3H5, free base. Um, and they were so proud of their ability to publish this crystal structure that they uh, basically said, uh, they put right in their title, uh, at last, the crystal structure of guanidine. And I'm, I was always shocked that the uh, journal editors allowed them to actually put that in their title. <laughs> But uh, the, the, several of the keys to doing this were to make uh, the bromide salt, the hydrobromide salt of guanidine, of, of dodecyl guanidine first, uh, and to uh, crystallize it in a very anhydrous form from acetonitrile. And then once these anhydrous, completely anhydrous crystals were formed, then to never expose them to water again to dissolve them in alcohol and uh, deprotonate with potassium T-butoxide, uh, then evaporate off the alcohol, and, uh, methanol, and to uh, obtain, take the crystals, which at that point still contain a little bit of methanol, and again recrystallize them from acetonitrile. And this manages to remove all of the water. This was uh, the first preparation that actually gives an elemental analysis that matches that predicted for the free base. So we haven't actually gotten uh, crystal structures of those, those dodecyl guanidine crystals, but we've gotten some of some derivatives. Uh, and as I said, they all match the elemental analyses required to be certain that they have no water in them. Uh, so this work was published uh, actually just this year uh, by Andrew Benikwa, who is now uh, on the chemistry faculty at the University of Dodoma in Tanzania, which is his home country. So the first thing I'd like to show you is what the infrared spectrum of dodecyl guanidine uh, free base looks like. This is the, the structure of the dodecyl guanidine uh, in aprotic solvents, uh, benzene, carbon tetrachloride, dimethyl, uh, dichloromethane, and uh, chloroform. The strongest band uh, is a carbon-nitrogen stretch vibration, which is uh, always between the range of about 1645 and 1651 wave number. And this is actually very different from what has, has ever been observed by taking arginine and trying to titrate it to high pH. One of the classic, um, classic papers that uh, looks at this is by uh, a group, uh, Venyaminov and Kalnin, uh, in 1990, they published a comparison of the spectrum in this region uh, of arginine alanine at pH 5.6. This is the classic band shape of the, the uh, protonated arginine side chain. Uh, by raising the pH to 11.2, they started to see this very, very clear band at, at uh, around 1560 wave number. 
uh, which many people, including myself, had thought for a number of years was characteristic of the uh, initiation of deprotonation of the guanidine side chain. In fact, uh, that, these spectra prove that that is not true. Uh, while we get the same spectrum if we take this high pH uh, solution of guanidine, whether it's ethyl guanidine or dodecyl guanidine, and we extract it into chloroform, we get very much the same spectrum. The problem is that the extraction is pulling along at least one water molecule per uh, guanidine, and that water molecule actually results in formation of the guanidinium hydroxide pair. Uh, so that this uh, band here at 1560 is not characteristic of truly deprotonated guanidine. Instead, it's only characteristic of the guanidinium hydroxide uh, uh, ion pair present in nonpolar solution. Uh, it's also uh, similar in uh, aqueous solution. This uh, corresponds then <clears throat> to uh, a change between, in this case, a, a chloride salt uh, of the uh, guanidine uh, and in aqueous solution these would be uh, not ion paired but actually completely separated. But uh, at high pH, uh, the uh, solvated Guanidine, guanidinium, which is surrounded by water molecules, uh, gets to be eventually uh, replaced, some, uh, at least a portion of that solvation shell must be replaced by hydroxide, which is capable of making stronger H bonds to uh, the high NH groups, probably of two uh, NH2s simultaneously. So there's two positions within this structure where it's likely that this hydroxide binds at uh, high pH. And the, the uh, pH that seems to be the midpoint for this titration, although it's uh, traditionally in textbooks assigned at about 12.5, is actually probably closer to 13.7, corresponding to about 200 millimolar dissociation constant for hydroxide. And at that 200 millimolar, uh, almost one out of 100 water molecules is deprotonated. So it's not too surprising that uh, this stronger H bonding of the hydroxide is capable of displacing a water molecule from this first salvation cell and replacing it by hydroxide. And this is an even easier replacement in nonpolar solvents where there's no competition from, uh, excuse me, in aprotic solvents where there's no competition from the, the solvent itself. So this band is particularly characteristic, this band at 1560 is particularly characteristic of arginine hydroxide rather than deprotonated arginine. And this uh, has prompted us to do some re-evaluation of some other experiments. Now, in the uh, results from the IR uh, are also confirmed by NMR. So this is proton NMR, and we argue that this is uh, the first observation of the chemical shifts of the protons on the guanidine group. So in uh, uh, benzene D6, we observe this at 3.56 parts per million. At, uh, in DMSO, again, the, the free base, uh, we see that resonance at 4.72. These uh, peaks here uh, correspond to an integrated area of four protons uh, per, uh, per uh, dodecyl guanidine. And by comparison, this uh, chemical shift value uh, is much farther downfield in the hydrobromide salt, which uh, can be made from this free base uh, just by adding H HBr, uh, removing water, and then redissolving in the DMSOD6. Uh, an interesting uh, aspect of this, these NMR, is that you can't observe these uh, chemical shifts for the guanidine group in the presence of even small amounts of water. Uh, they exchange very quickly, and all you see is a, a a, a band corresponding to the, the water chemical shift. Uh, even solvents that you think would work uh, are problematic. So we, we don't show this in chloroform. Uh, for many years we thought uh, and were confused uh, thinking that this uh, uh, proton uh, resonance from the guanidine group was actually at around 6.1 uh, ppm, which is actually identical with the chemical shift value for chloroform. Uh, and so even though we started with chloroform D, uh, we would see a peak there that had an, a, uh, an integrated area of four protons per 
uh, dodecyl guanidine, no matter what concentration of guanidine we used, it would always rise to that level. And of course, if we use the pure chloroform D6, we saw just a tiny, tiny residual uh, band at 6.1. Well, it turns out that that assignment was, was uh, very confused because the, uh, the protons from the uh, dodecyl guanidine were actually ending up on the chloroform. And that's because this is such a strong base that it actually has an appreciable rate of deprotonating chloroform. So uh, this we can show uh, more easily it, uh, on a time scale that can, is a little bit slower by adding chloroform to benzene. Uh, and in that case, uh, this next slide shows some of the time-dependent behavior. So we've, we've just um, done some horizontal displacement of the, the spectra uh, over successive times, shifting them to the right. And so uh, you cannot see the uh, protons of the guanidine group because they're so broad and, and down in the noise here. But they're actually, uh, in terms of, of numbers of protons, what those four protons are doing is they are uh, shifting onto the chloroform D and resulting in protonated chloroform rising with time. Uh, the, you can see this in this plot. The, this is the intensity of the protonated chloroform signal at 6.1 ppm, and it corresponds to uh, just a little over four protons. Uh, meanwhile, uh, what starts out as four protons in pure benzene D6, once you add the chloroform, it drops very quickly within five minutes, even though this is only uh, a few millimolar chloroform, and uh, continues to drop. This is uh, another thing that's quite surprising was that when we actually analyzed this carefully like this, we could see that there's even uh, catalyzed exchange of protons for deuterons on benzene D6, which is to say that there is an appreciable rate of base catalyzed deprotonation of benzene by dodecyl guanidine free base. This means that this is a much stronger base, I think, than, than almost anyone had ever realized. The pKa in textbooks of 12.5 is as I said, corresponds only to binding of hydroxide. The actual deprotonation of this probably has a pKa uh, of closer to 15 or possibly even higher. Uh, we can see this also from N15 chemical shift values, which have never been observed before. The dodecyl guanidine free base, you can see an amino proton, uh, excuse me, an a nitrogen corresponding to the imino group at 110 ppm downfield. This is the amino nitrogen at 49 ppm. This, of course, was measured with 90% uh, uh, N15 labeled dodecyl guanidine, which Andrew uh, synthesized. And again, this is the HBr salt, which shows that you, you see only a single uh, N15 peak corresponding to both nitrogens. These were uh, synthesized with N15 labels only at the two terminal nitrogens using dodecylamine plus N15 labeled thiourea uh, as the starting materials. Now, this uh, separation of 60 ppm between the amino and imino protons is much greater than anyone has ever observed for arginine or other derivatives of it. And in fact, uh, it again, uh, is much larger than the shifts that are occurring for arginine as you go through this titration of around pH 13.8. Uh, this chemical shift scale is based, uh, is referenced to a different standard than the one that we used in the preceding slide. So don't worry too much about the starting value being about 22 ppm uh, larger. The main thing is that this only changes by, again, by about 22 ppm as you go through this titration, which is really only a very small fraction of what we see for a true deprotonation. So the conclusion is that, uh, uh, again, this, uh, these bands, for example, at 1556 wave number, which uh, we measured in my lab in 2004 using N15 labeled bacteria rhodopsin from Judy Hertzfeld's lab, we interpreted uh, this band uh, as being the largest band due to arginine in the time-resolved difference spectra of Br with its M intermediate state. So the positive band here, uh, which is sensitive to N15 labeling, it changes between the green and the blue, means that this is a, a band that must be assigned to arginine. We always interpreted this as due to an arginine deprotonation, which meant that uh, our uh, 
uh, estimation of what was the most likely proton